For the Koreans, the opening days of the Imjin War were a time of terror and panic, of confusion, despair. The onslaught of Hideyoshi's invasion, the Koreans were so physically and mentally overwhelmed that they were unable to stop it. But then the initial panic subsided, and the Korean people began to fight back. In the middle of June, three weeks into the war, the Japanese would encounter the first local Korean resistance, a grassroots guerrilla movement known as the Weebyong, the Righteous Armies. And they'd suffer their first defeat on land. That's coming up. The rise of the Weebyong, Korea's righteous armies, started with this man, Kwok jae -yu. He wasn't a soldier. He was a member of the Yangban upper class, a landowner. He'd passed the civil service exam, but had never gotten a government post, supposedly because he was too critical of the government, too independent-minded, too prickly. At the start of the war, Kwok jae -yu is living quietly on his family land holdings in southwest Gyeongsang province, in Wiryong County. In the initial Japanese thrust north, Kuroda Nagamasa's third contingent, on the west road, seems to be heading toward Wiryong, so the government troops there all run away. Kuroda's contingent ends up bypassing the county. They never show up. But then secondary Japanese units start spreading out through Kyongsang, taking over. As they approach Wiryong, Kwok jae -yu forms a small militia of farmers and laborers, about 50 men. He needs weapons and food for them, so he breaks into the government storehouse that the fleeing government troops have abandoned. This will get him into some trouble. The Kyongsang governor accuses him of stealing. Kwok shrugs it off. The government troops have been useless, so he's going to do something. The Japanese force that's heading Kwok's way, it's part of the 6th contingent that landed at Pusan about a week into the invasion. A unit under Anko Kuji Eke is marching west through southern Kyongsang province, heading toward Chola province, Korea's breadbasket, where a lot of rice is growing. And the Koreans... They're watching. They see Anko Kuji's scouts ranging ahead to the Nam River and searching out a shallow spot where it can be waded across. When the scouts find a suitable crossing point, they mark it with stakes, then head back to Anko Kuji's main force to show them the way the next day. That night, Kwok's men remove the stakes from the river crossing and plant them nearby in deep water. Anko Kuji's men arrive the next day and wade into the river, following the stakes. This leads them into water over their heads. Soon, they're struggling, floundering about, weighed down by their heavy weapons and armor. That's when Kwok Jeyu's men emerge from the reeds lining the shore and attack. They're inexperienced fighters, but with the Japanese floundering in deep water and their muskets and gunpowder soaked, the Koreans have a big advantage. They cut down Anko Kuji's men as they straggle ashore, killing as many as they can. Then, before the survivors can regroup, they retreat. This engagement, about 50 Koreans against 150 Japanese, June 16, 1592, it's Korea's first victory on land. Kwok jae -yu would become a folk hero in the Imjin War, almost a mythical figure, leading his growing army of guerrilla fighters in hit-and-run attacks against the Japanese in the south. He would be known as the Red Coat General for the distinctive red robe that he wore. It was supposedly dyed in the menstrual blood of young virgins.
to infuse it with yin energy to repel the yang energy of Japanese bullets. This was probably just a legend, one of many that were told about Kwok and his exploits. But the fact remains that he never was injured. Another civilian who would raise a private army to resist the Japanese was Ko Gyeong Myung. Like Kwok Jae Yu, Ko had never made it into the civil service, the great ambition of Korea's educated elite. He was living in obscurity when the war broke out, a gentleman farmer down in the remote southwest corner of Chola province. After hearing the shocking news that Seoul had fallen, he raised a force of volunteers with the intention of marching north to the capital to attack the Japanese. But he never gets that far. Instead, he ends up combining forces with government troops to attack the Japanese at Kumsan on the North Chola border. This kind of frontal assault on experienced Japanese troops, it's not a good idea. The Koreans get beaten and Ko Gyeong Myung is killed. His actions, though, inspire others, including his own son, who would form a guerrilla force that called itself the Band That Seeks Revenge. Another Wee Byung leader was Kim Chon Il. He raises a small civilian force, about 300 men, in Naju, then holds up on Kangwa Island to the west of Seoul and starts harassing the Japanese. This is where the Wee Byung are most effective. Hit and run raids, disrupting supply lines and communications, attacking foraging parties when the Japanese venture out of their fortresses looking for food. Kim Chun il and his men caused the Japanese significant trouble. Finally, one last Wee Byung leader that definitely deserves mention is Cho Hun. He's an interesting character, a government official, kind of prickly, like Kwak Jae Yu. Cho had been vehemently outspoken before the war, warning that Hideyoshi couldn't be trusted, that he was going to attack, and that Korea had to prepare. When Hideyoshi sent emissaries to Seoul in 1591, Cho said that they should be executed and their heads hung in the street. He supposedly even knelt in front of Kyungbok Palace for three days, wailing and banging his head on the ground to awaken King Sonjo to the danger. So he was kind of a hothead, a fanatic, that's what people thought. Then the invasion came, and he was proved right. Cho Hon raised a civilian army of 1,100 men in the central province of Chungcheong. He led them to the town of Chongju, which Kuroda Nagamasa's third contingent had taken on the march north to Seoul. It was now being held by only a small garrison of Japanese and was vulnerable. So Cho Hun decided to retake it. And he did. Assisted by 500 government troops and a second guerrilla group known as Monk Soldiers, that we'll talk about later, Cho Hun drove the Japanese garrison out of Chongju and retook the town. He then continued south to the Japanese-held fortress at Kumsan, where Ko Gyeong Myung had been killed the previous month. Now Kumsan, it's strategically important. It guards the approaches to Chola province, the breadbasket province. That's why the Japanese took it. And that's why the Koreans want it back. What followed was the Second Battle of Kumsan. For the Koreans, it's a disaster, a debacle, mostly caused by Cho Hun's resentment over a slight. The governor of Chungcheong province, in his official report on the earlier victory at Chongju, had given almost all the credit to the government troops and monk soldiers and hardly mentioned Cho Hun and his Wee Byung army at all. This so angered Cho Hun that he went ahead with his remaining 700 men and attacked Kumsan on his own. It was a huge mistake. The Kumsan garrison, it's much too large for Cho to take on alone. There's thousands of Japanese troops inside the walls, under 6th Contingent Daimyo leader Kobayakawa Takakage, one of Hideyoshi's most seasoned commanders. During the night, Kobayakawa secretly sends a body of men out to circle around behind the Koreans. When the battle begins the next morning, Cho Hun and his men find themselves being attacked 
both from the front and the rear. The result is a slaughter. Cho and his Weibyung army are completely destroyed. They would come to be known as the 700 Martyrs. Weibyung civilian fighters would play a significant role in wearing down the Japanese in Korea. Every time they attacked the Japanese directly, win or lose, they chipped away at their strength. And in between, they're waging a campaign of harassment, making it difficult for the Japanese to maintain supply lines and communications up through Korea, further isolating forward units in Seoul and Pyongyang. Weibyung guerrillas are also making it dangerous for Japanese foraging parties to leave the safety of their fortresses to go out looking for food. But they'll have to. Winter is coming on, and supplies? They're running out. The Japanese are about to get hungry. Well, that's it for this week. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you next time.